Now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our third speaker, by Dr. Safi Koskos. He is an administrator in the managerial sciences uh, with over 40 years of broad-based experience in strategic planning, leadership, and business ethics with an emphasis on strategic management in the corporate and academic worlds. He's a co-founder of East West University Chicago and was elected as president of its board of directors from 1979 to 2005. He continues to serve on his board as an ex officio. He is the founder and president of Strategic Edge Management Consultants. Dr. Koskos helped many mid level and large corporations successfully develop their business portfolios. His consultant firm focused on strategic development within the healthcare industry and founded the American Strategic Healthcare Management Company, which is active in the healthcare field in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. In addition to his focus on strategic management science, Dr. Koskos has studied Abrahamic religions and lectured throughout the US and the Middle East on subjects related to Islam, interfaith, and reconciliation between evangelicals and American Muslims. He's senior researcher in Islam and multi-faith reconciliation with George Mason University, Center for World Religions, Diplomacy, and Conflict Resolution. Dr. Koskos translated and published the Quran into simple, easy to understand English in January 2015 and published the Quran with references to the Bible in January 2016. This book has 3000 references to the Old and the New Testaments. Dr. Koskos is the founder and president of the International Quran Research Association. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, over to you, Dr. Kaskas. Thank you, Georgie. Ladies and gentlemen, I like to start with the traditional Muslim salutation. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. When I was invited to participate in this discussion, I immediately accepted, as I was already intrigued with the subject of consciousness from the time I first encountered the Quranic narrative about the creation of Adam in around 2009. Later, I worked for six years on my Quran translation. Uh, I think having listened to the previous two uh, speaker, I would like to say a few words about uh, my understanding of Islam. Uh, it's very important that we uh, explain the concept. So we will be talking about the same thing. My definition of Islam, Islam is a word that has the root of silm. Silm in Arabic means peace. So a Muslim, by definition, should be a peacemaker. If a Muslim does not himself to be a peacemaker, he will have problems living his life among other people. Other people have uh, various definition of Islam, for instance, uh, like total submission to God. So Muslims believe that there is a God who is the creator of this universe. Uh, and this is universal for all Muslim, regardless of sects. Now, in preparation to this talk, uh, I spoke to many Muslim friends with different educational background, different gender, different age, uh, you know, different people trying to see what kind of reaction they will have to this subject. I found out that most of them take consciousness for granted. They never thought about it that much. They enjoy being aware of who they are as individuals relating to their environment with, co with cognitive thoughts through their five senses, being aware of things happening around them and having an identity is considered for most people simply part of being alive. Yet for me, being always aware of who I am and using my intellect to try to make sense of my existence, I always needed to find answers for three basic questions related to my own existence and whether this existence will go on beyond my life on earth. 
The three basic questions are, where did I come from? Why I'm here? And where do I go from here? The issue that I struggled with the most was, what will happen to my consciousness after I die? My acute awareness of my identity as a thinking person, my knowledge about my environment and the universe, all this make the questions of what happens to my consciousness after death a critical one. Then I encountered answers given to me through the Quran by Allah, the creator of this universe and its programmer. The Quran's narrative as the direct word of Allah in relation to the story of Adam's creation is very telling. I start with a, it starts with a conversation between God and the angels in the second chapter of the Quran, verse 30. The story starts this way. When your Lord told the angels, I will place a steward on earth. They said, will you put someone there who will corrupt it? and shed blood while we glorify, praise, and sanctify you? He said, I know things you don't know. Like I said, this is chapter two of the Quran, verse 30. I had to stop here and wonder, why is God telling the angels what he wants to do? He certainly does not need their permission. Then I thought, why is he calling this creature he intend to create a steward? In Arabic, Khalifa, a person in charge of the planet, a successor. Why? How important will this guy be? Why didn't he simply say, I will create a human being and I will call him Adam? Was this Adam a special human being? Stranger than that was the, angel, the angel's reply. They said, will you put someone there who will corrupt it and shed blood? while we glorify, praise, and sanctify you? He said, I know what you don't know. They apparently had knowledge that earth has already some kind of humans who are corrupting the earth and engaged in killing each other as well as other living beings. So is God telling me that he had other human beings on earth before the creation of Adam? But Adam is going to be an enhanced version maybe? This is apparently the intent of this verse. But even if this is true, why would God put emphasis on the creation of Adam and gathers the angels to tell, to tell them about his decision as if he is announcing an event that will change the future of the earth from that moment on? I was hoping that his reply will clarify this matter. But to my disappointment, he simply told the angels, I know what you don't know. So I looked further, hoping to find the answer. What is that that he knows about Adam that the angels had no way to know on their own? The next verse may actually give us the answer. God, the verse said, taught Adam the names of all things and then showed them to the angels. He said, tell me the names of these if you are sure of yourself. Here, God is telling us that he taught Adam the names of everything around him. And he then showed these things to the angels and asked them to name them, but they failed. Their reply as the Quran tells us was, may you be exalted in your glory. We know nothing except that you have taught us. You are the all-knowing, the wise. Their excuse for not knowing was that they only know what they were taught. They are intellectually limited to what they are taught. Was Adam different from them? Yes. The Quran explained, this is in the following verse. God said, Adam, tell them the names. When he told them the names, meaning the names he learned from God, God said to the angels, did I not tell you that I know the hidden reality of the heavens and the earth, and I know what you, what you, what you show and what you hide? 
Adam apparently was teachable. He was able to receive information, store it, remember it, and communicate it. He apparently had perception. At this point, I realized why God framed the story with a comparison between the angels and Adam. He was trying to tell all of us that this new human being is unlike the angels. He has a unique aspect that they did not have. He has consciousness and an intellect. After God made his first poem, he started to make another poem. He told the angels, bow down to Adam. And they all bowed down as a sign of respect to Adam's unique intellect, except for Iblis. The Quran tells us who refused out of arrogance and became among the ungrateful. In this verse, God chose to introduce to us another one of his creation called Iblis, known also as Satan, the devil. In the Quran, however, he is another conscious creature made out of, of the flame of fire, meaning his, he is oxygen-based, while Adam was carbon-based. Iblis consciously refused to buy down to Adam. His excuse was Adam is created from the dirt of the earth while he was made from fire. So he considered himself better than Adam. This led him to disobey God out of arrogance. The Quran actually was setting the stage to tell us about the drama that was emerging for Adam and will continue to evolve as long as, long as he and his descendants are in existence. Now the drama was about to start unfolding. When in the following verse, God decides to give Adam a free will and equip him with the freedom to choose. And when Iblis tried to interfere, and corrupt every decision made by Adam. Here is the way the Quran tells that part of the story. Right after God had given Adam and his wife the program for free will, he said, Adam, live with your spouse in the, in the, in the heavenly garden and eat whatever you want, but do not come near this tree or you will be unjust. Actually, it could have been any tree God was testing Adam ability to choose, but Satan made them slip, the Quran says, and caused them to be expelled from where they were. Satan made them slip, the Quran said. People may understand this any way they choose, but I choose to understand it as an exercise to make sure that the program for freedom to choose is working. If Adam was strict in obeying God and wanted to always obey him, he will be like the angels and uh, who are programmed to always obey. But for the program to work, Adam needed to demonstrate that he is exercising his freedom to choose, that he may obey or disobey. Only if he disobeys, we will know for sure that the program is working. So by choosing to eat from the tree, he gave God proof that the program God gave him is working. This was the final step that will make Adam ready to go down to earth and start a new life of consciousness where he is able to exercise his freedom to choose and be responsible for his choices. Adam, however, we are told by the Quran, immediately realized after eating from the tree that he made the wrong choice and he disobeyed God. He asked God to teach him, what do we do after this? Because that was the first time he exercised his freedom to choose and made a mistake. He realized he made a mistake and God taught him to repent and forgave him. The Quran teaches that God taught him to repent and forgave him. In the Quran, there is no original sin. The Quran summarizes this event this way. Then Adam received words from his God and God accepted his repentance. He alone, he means God alone, is the acceptor of repentance. 
the mercy giver. God, then God said, all of you, means Adam, his wife, and Satan, all of you go down from the garden. When my guidance come to you, whoever follows my guidance will not have fear or grief. This is the Quranic narrative about the creation of Adam. The various stages God used to prepare him to live on earth for a short while in order for Adam or his descendants to exercise their freedom to choose. We all have two choices while we're here on earth. We can summarize all the millions of cho choices we make during our life on earth in two choices, only two. Am I choosing to do this to please God or is it to please myself, my selfishness and my ego? In fact, these are the two choices, and there is no other choice. These choices can be made because Adam had consciousness and an intellect that will enable him to make choices. Let me give you an example, a practical example of how our choices are limited to these two choices. My coming to you today, it can be for one of the two choices. Either I'm coming to share the knowledge I believe God gave me, so I'll spread it and that will be pleasing to God. Or I came here to be, to be with you, so you'd say, this guy, Kaskas, is knowledgeable about the Quran. He's a great guy. That will be to feed my own ego. These are the two choices I'm talking about. I chose to be with you, and I only know the exact purpose, the real purpose of why I'm here with you. God also know the purpose. The Quran, as you have noticed, focused in this story about Adam. He is considered the first human being with consciousness, the first of the homo sapiens. The Quran also talks about Adam's wife. The Quran doesn't name Adam's wife, doesn't call her Eve. But we all know from the Old Testament that her name was Eve. In fact, uh, the Quran, uh, the Quran actually contains many additional verses teaching us that we perceive the world around us through our senses. Surah Al-Balad, number 90 in the Quran, God says about the human beings, have we not gave him, means to, to the human being, two eyes and a tongue and two lips and have made the two ways of good and evil clear to him? Many times in the Quran, God talks about walk around the earth and take a look at uh, the way we created the earth and how we made everything available to you. So you will be grateful to God and you will be servants to other human beings. You will help other human beings. God here is teaching us that we perceive the world around us through our senses. And that perception should lead to a realization that our purpose on earth is to recognize God as our creator and to try to worship him through serving others. Or as the Quran puts it, and have made the two ways of good and evil clear to him. Actually, we have a saying of Prophet Muhammad, you will not be considered a believer unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. So here I would like to remind my audience that as uh, in uh, the, greatest, the greatest commandment that Jesus told, the Quran teaches the same thing. Loving God is the greatest commandment. And li like it, there is the other commandment of loving your neighbor. These two commandments, upon these two commandments, everything is built. And Islam is not the name of the religion given to Muhammad only. The Quran teaches us that Islam is the religion given to Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, that were taught by Jesus, who is considered by Muslim, the ultimate Muslim, and then to Muhammad. Thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, I really appreciate the fact you gave me this opportunity to participate here with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Safi uh, Kaskas. Thank you so much for sharing with us uh, these uh, insights and these ideas. 
and the way in which uh, you related exactly our ability to recognize why we are here. And truly, this is what we're exploring. And the, the two choices we have in this process.